So I want to talk about new things. I was working at a media company and I was kind of locked in because I had sold them my startup, so I had a lot of free time because media companies tend to not do things as quickly as startups do. Um, but when I first came to America, um, I found this thing called the Sharper Image. I was nine years old and the Sharper Image was full of all kinds of things that were unimaginable to me. It was unimaginable to me that these things could be sold and I used my first pocket money on kind of this superhero gadget that would let you hear things from far away because again, I couldn't believe that you could actually buy this thing. Uh, these days we have this Kickstarter thing which is where, where I spent all that free time I had at the media company. Um, browsing Kickstarter and <laughs> backing them with my media company money at the time. Uh, and Kickstarter is basically early adopter crack because it not only has all the things you can't imagine, um, but stuff exists because you want it to. Um, and the system seems from the outside, when you first look at it, the system seems like it works like this, that wow, like all possible avenues are being explored. But hold that thought for a sec. Um, so I've backed a lot of Kickstarter projects and I figure that in this room there are probably people who want to do their own Kickstarter projects and certainly people who have backed Kickstarter projects. And there's a lot of talk about what works and what doesn't, what fails and so on. So I kind of broke it down like this in terms of, you know, the 81% I've actually received the product and it's okay, right? And then we also, um, then there's this other section of stuff that happens. So. One thing that can happen is, is just personal issues. People are shits, or um, they don't deliver, or there's a war, or somebody's family member gets sick, or that kind of thing, so that's okay. Like, that happens. Um, then there's this stuff, which is, you know, the delivered product just doesn't work, it took really long, um, they under underestimated shipping, supply chain, that kind of stuff. This is all stuff that at this conference, there are people who can help novices through this. And if you've screwed up your project like this, it's because you didn't do your homework and talk to people who've done this before. So this is avoidable. But the third thing makes me angry. The third thing is when a product comes and it's not seamless enough for real life, and then also it's nice in theory, but kind of meh in practice, which means that you didn't freaking think it through before you put it through the manufacturing chain. And that means that you've made trash. And you made trash because you were lazy. And <laughs> before you do this, for the love of God, you have your device, check, is it seamless? Does it earn its keep? And if you use, and use it for a while, does it become a natural part of your life or are you just excited about it because it's bright and shiny? And if it's just bright and shiny, just keep it as a personal project. Do a blog post, put an instructable up, something like that. But don't fill our planet with it just because, I don't know, because you didn't think it through. Um, and uh, actually, the one thing that this remi reminds me of, because we were talking about eating animals and killing animals, is I come from a hunting culture that uh, is of the opinion that if you're going to kill an animal, you should make sure that that animal is an animal that you're going to eat. And, um, and this reminds me of uh, the same kind of waste that if you're going to fill the planet with a project, then it had better be a project that deserves to multiply. Um, Correlated to that is, this is not always possible, but Matt Webb mentioned this last year and I think this is still a good point. If you can, leave some wires at the back. So this is a Kindle that somebody repurposed to make into a into a weather module and, and you know, not many people will do that, but at least some people will, so that will be nice. Anyway, back to this, this kind of ecosystem where we kind of go, there's, there's, uh, we have this new possible world and it's being massively quickly explored. And we keep hearing this, that the possibilities are limitless. And I've heard this so much now that when I hear it, I feel like it should be uh, framed like this. And the reason I feel that way is because so often it's just not true. <laughs> you, <laughs> there are always inherent limits and inherent limits are nice. If you're a designer, you like to know where the limits are. Um, but at the same time, this is too many limits. So I was thinking, okay, fine. Um, 
if there's not enough parts, maybe more parts will make more possibilities. And in that case, you know, what parts are there? And I am half German, and so I like to catalog things. And so I mapped every single input, output, power, and connection possibility that I could possibly find on every website that can sell stuff to people like me. As in, I didn't add in things that only Apple can buy or stuff like that. And then I turned that into a card deck. And then I messed around with the card deck since last year, actually, because some of you might have been in my workshop last year. Um, and then some stuff about this map and so on kept nagging at me. For example, there are so many inputs. There's all kinds of ways that you can tell a machine about a world, about the world or about the things around it. But there are not many outputs. So basically what, what tends to happen or what you have is you have light. So a machine can go beaming some kind of light at you, some picture, some blinky thing, uh, or it makes sound. So it usually beeps. Um, sometimes it talks. Uh, and then it can move. Now, mo many, most machines don't move. This is an entire section that just doesn't tend to get used very often. And then there's the freaky category of relays. Okay, so the, so the machine can turn on, off and on something else, or it can go through the web and tell stuff to the web, which is, I think, kind of cheating in a way in the context that I'm talking about here. Uh, or it can maybe change color with like thermochromic paints or that kind of thing. Or maybe it can print stuff. And that's kind of it. Like, I honestly, I, I didn't find many other things in that other category. And I'm sick of these kind of bleating, blinking, attention-starved creatures in my house. They're, they're whining about like battery life, and, and they're, they're at night, they, the room is full of this glow of these things. And I want subtler companions. I want butlers. I want politeness. I want self-reliance. Um, I want a range of expression, right? Like imagine if people just shone light at you all the time, and just shone light and gave you sound. That's it. Um, so I'm thinking that the petri dish is not really a petri dish. What tends to happen is the technology go goes down the path of least resistance. So, sort of like water goes down like a stream. And that's because uh, we have lots of ready-made parts and we have ready-made libraries and coders and engineers and designers like things that are already there. That well, We can leverage this to do this, right? And similar ideas tend to come and go in waves. Kickstarter has the 3D printer wave, or it has the, the uh, light bulbs that you can control your f with your phone wave. Suddenly there's like 10 projects that are exactly like that. And that's because things are suddenly easy. Um, but there's lots of kind of ignored, more human territory in between these things that I think would be interesting to go into more. So how do we do that? So um, Basically, you can break it down into, you can wait for parts to cross a kind of magic threshold of better. Um, for this, big companies tend to have the advantage because they get the parts first, and they have the means to kind of implement the new parts. Um, but for what it's worth, these are things that I've found interesting lately. Um, nice, cheap thermal cameras. Got a cool picture of my cat. Um, tiny projectors that you can put into like your phone or whatever. Uh, tiny spectrometers, so you can, uh, you can detect things that were previously undetectable. You can keep that in your pocket and check if the avocado is ripe or something like that. Um, so that's one way. Another way is that you can recombine existing parts. So this is an ancient example. But if you take a camera and a phone and you take Flickr, suddenly you have this thing that now I can show all my friends, like my frivolous discoveries of like a crack in the sidewalk or something. Um, uh, another more recent thing is this, uh, now there are many things out there like this, which is basically button. So um, it's one big button. It's attached to the GSM network, not the Wi-Fi network, because the Wi-Fi network tends to be shit. So, and then it has LEDs, that, so it can tell you something, but again, LEDs, meh. But then it attaches to if this, then that. And in my house, we use this for the laundry. So when, one of us puts the laundry in the laundry machine, we smack the button, and it sends a text message to both of us, and then we know that when we get home, one of us is gonna take it out so that it doesn't get stuck in the washing machine. Now, of course, you can say, why don't you have a smart washing machine? Because I don't have one yet, because it doesn't exist yet. But this is a pretty good kind of halfway point. The other thing you can do is, if you have a, the litter box, like if nobody smacks the button for long enough, then it sends a message. 
these kinds of things. The other thing you can do is you can find new applications for old parts. So the thing you see at the top, the cube, is a haptic weather vane. So uh, the cube actually changes temperature with a piezo element inside, not a piezo, a peltier element <laughs> inside it, that when you touch it, you can feel what temperature it, it is outside. Um, the other thing, the glowing LED thing, that's powered by gravity. This is the other thing that I was noticing when I was looking through all these parts, is that many power options are completely ignored. Like we think basically two things, rechargeable battery or solar panel. But there's all kinds of other things that we just don't remember when we're designing a new thing. Um, and then another thing which just randomly occurred to me as I was making these slides is that I would kind of like to be able to treat my phone like a smart dog and not like a dumb person when I'm talking to it, because Siri doesn't tend to hear what I say. Another thing you can do is you can develop new parts. And one uh, group that is kind of doing this a lot is a Disney Research is coming up with lots of freaky new parts all the time. They have a YouTube channel that's really fun to follow. Um, they, <laughs> one of these things is how to get power from static electricity by just kind of rubbing Teflon paper on conductive surfaces. Uh, another one is these accoutrements where you have a, a plastic tube and then you have a sound going in one end, the other end goes to a microphone, but when you squeeze the tube, it changes the sound, and then the microphone uh, uses that to change things. So you can have, have these sort of semi, I don't know, well, anyway, a different way of controlling things. Uh, and the final thing is, is a neat thing that you can actually, you can touch textures in the air. There's these little guns that you can put on the side of, say, your TV while you're playing with your Kinect, or, and you can hold your hand in the air like this, and then these little guns shoot these vortexes of air at your hands, so you can actually feel smoothness or roughness, or, or you can feel a ping pong ball if you're playing that. Um, so that's very nice to have a research facility, but you probably don't. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't think about new parts. Uh, here are some examples of uh, info displays that are not based on light. So the first one is Flock by Berg, so when you get a tweet, a little bird comes out, and this other one is Ugle, by Voy, which is uh, that owl, it turns. Um, there's an iPhone app, so basically if, if I'm, I don't know, at the office or something and I want to send a message home, but I don't want it to be an explicit message, I just want it to be kind of a subtle little message that only the family understands. I can turn the owl on my phone and it turns it home and then people get the message. Um, like, did you get that job or not? I don't. Um, the, actually, and at this conference, um, I just now saw this Vai Kai which is like a uh, wooden monkey that you can stroke the head of the monkey and go check it out. Um, another thing is this Bradley tactile watch where they took ball bearings and there's magnets behind the ball bearings and they turn so you can check your watch by touching it, which is good for blind people or people who want to seem more polite. Um, and this, all of this kind of makes me think that we have a lot of coders and designers who are um, developing stuff right now. Uh, but I think we could maybe use more mechanical engineers, goldsmiths, machinists, tailors, woodworkers, uh, because we tend to have this kind of weird blindness in the tech industry just because every industry has its own blindness. I used to be a metalsmith, and one thing I noticed was that uh, if you take a ring, for example, and you, give, you tell a goldsmith, make a ring, they'll treat the metal like it's paper and glue. So you cut out a strip and you kind of solder it together, now you have a ring. You take it to a blacksmith, they'll take a lump of metal, bang a hole into it, stretch it out, now it's a ring. A machinist will cut a ring out of a block of metal. A caster will pour it into a thing. And so while I was doing that, I always used to talk about why can't there be a kind of unified theory of metals where we take any project and we take the, media, the method that applies best to that project or combine methods because then you can do a lot more interesting things. And right now, I feel like in technology, we're, we, are, we are wired for screens and for beeps and for, that, and for rechargeable batteries. And so we don't tend to think about anything else. And what I'm hoping is that we'll end up with, when we explore these other areas, we'll end up with more human, more tactile, more polite stuff, and 
but this means that there will be fewer ready-made uh, shortcuts available. Um, and I, I'm hoping for a kind of polite, relevant information from my house in the right context. For example, if I uh, have an app that wants me to run, I don't want to be reminded that I should run if I'm out to dinner with my friends. But maybe if I'm sitting on the couch watching TV, perhaps there could be a quiet, subtle reminder beside the TV going, you know what, now is about the time you should go running. But again, it doesn't have to be a screen. It doesn't have to, anyway. Um, somebody else who's been talking about this is Brett Victor, who gave a talk called The Human, Humane Representation of Thought. And he said, humane is never a default. If you just ride the current wave of technology and let technology lead wherever it leads you, it's going to lead you to a tighter and tighter cage. So if we want to make new things, we need to tend to the areas beside the big paths and take a guide with you, hopefully from a completely different industry, because that's where we'll really find something new. Thank you.